join me in inviting Daniel Juster to come and speak with us. Thank you, Dan. We are ready to receive. Wow. Here we are, and you're worn out from the worship and the communion, and I'm supposed to bring you a message. And then we could dismiss you for dinner and invite you back for the message. But then you would all be falling asleep because the dinner is in your stomach. So what are we going to do? We're going to just wake ourselves up for a few minutes. Let me share a couple of things though that are on my heart. Number one, I hope that all of you are on the Tikkun mailing list and get the monthly Tikkun International letter. Is there anybody here that doesn't raise your hand? Everybody gets it. Okay, if you don't get it, please go online and sign up for it or drop your name and address on the table. If we have your registration, I suppose we put you on that, but we want you to be informed of what we're doing in Israel and around the world and to be connected. In addition to that, I just want to tell you that many of you were involved in the home going of our son Samuel Peter 18 years ago and uh, the new book came out finally and I really believe it wasn't supposed to come out until there was much longer reflection about it. The story, the story of Samuel, if you were with us on that, this is your story. If you were not part of us back then, it will help you to understand what we went through and actually that event was a tremendous blow and it was followed up by a second blow and almost a third blow and we recovered from it but there are some things that happened that were damaging that have never come back to what I think they were intended to be. It was an awesome demonic attack and yet we recovered in Tikkun and on the other end of that, there were so many miracles that happened during that time. I mean, supernatural interventions of God. Who can figure it? And this book is actually an encouragement that in times of tragedy and setback, God is yet Lord. He will pull you through. He will restore. And he'll bring you to something better. Amen. And that's what happened in our lives. And so I want you to be encouraged by this book, The Story of Samuel. It's a good companion to Patty's book, uh, uh, Fire. The, uh, Defined by Fire. Defined by Fire. Thank you. A little mental glitch there. Put your senile apostle out to pastor. Uh, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Now, I'm still very sharp. At least I was yesterday. Then, for those of you who have Spanish-speaking friends, Growing to Maturity is now in Spanish. We have some of those for you. The book that was just published last year, Mutual Blessing, on why we are here and what the meaning of life is and how we should live it and what our everlasting life will be like. Wouldn't you like a description of what your everlasting life will be like? Well, that's in this book, and it's a, it's, it's a very encouraging book, but it's an easy-to-read book called Mutual Blessing, Discovering the Ultimate Destiny of Creation, and I have more books coming out that you'll hear about next year. I'll have a few more for you next year, and then I'm going to hopefully retire from writing all these books. But I don't want to write them, you know, and it comes to me to write them. We're talking about outreach or evangelism. And I want to talk about, for a few minutes today, passion for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Many evangelicals think that the work of the Holy Spirit is so subtle and so hidden that you can't hardly perceive it at all. Except that when a person comes to know Yeshua, that was the Holy Spirit. And if a person comes to believe 
in Yeshua and they get born again, that was the Holy Spirit. And that is absolutely true. I mean, that part of the Holy Spirit is at work for people that don't believe in everything that we believe in. But I think one of the great uh, words on the work of the Holy Spirit was from John Wimber, who, and I want you to mark this in your head, makes you uncomfortable. This is what John Wimber said about the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is present in power, stuff happens. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit is present in power, stuff happens. Now John Wimber didn't know this, but he was reflecting rabbinic theology. Did you know that? Because throughout the Talmud and in the rabbinic literature where it talks about the presence of the Holy Spirit in power, we could summarize what rabbinic Judaism teaches about the presence and power of the Holy Spirit by saying, stuff happens. It's very interesting. Now the rabbis understood that because they read scripture and they found, for example, when the Spirit of God fell on King Saul, what did he do? He rolled on the ground and prophesied. He was acting like Toronto 3,000 years before it. And it happened to him again. Even when he was in rebellion, the Spirit came on him in power and it happened again. And you see throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, amazing things happen when the Holy Spirit came in power. But I want to talk about one aspect of the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit's involvement in uh, encouragement, comforting, the Holy Spirit's work in conviction of sin and bringing us back to the Lord, the Holy Spirit's work in regards to uh, healing, and so many other things. Because, you know, the Ruach HaKodesh is foundational in the New Covenant Scriptures to everything we are and do. So you only have connection to Yeshua through the Holy Spirit. When the New Covenant says, Messiah in you, the hope of glory, it's speaking about the Holy Spirit. But I want to speak about the Holy Spirit with regards to the implications for reaching people with the good news of Yeshua which was the foundation of our movement, that we were going to be a movement that reaches people for Yeshua. We find that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was very much connected to reaching people for Yeshua. And in history, when there were revivals, when there were mighty outpourings of the Holy Spirit, there was always a harvest of people that had been rebellious and living without God. And there was a transformation of the region when there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You can read about this in the Puritan revivals. You can read about it in the Jonathan Edwards revivals. You can read about it in the Second Great Revival, uh, revivals in the States, the Hebrides revivals. Char uh, Charles Schmidt, our friend, his book, um, on the, the revivals that he wrote about, Floods Upon Dry Grounds. And there are so many books on this that we could read books on revivals and their implications for the rest of our lives. But when the Holy Spirit is poured out in power, one of the things that happens is that people that don't know Yeshua are touched. That's what happened in the Jesus movement. There was such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that people came to know Yeshua all the time because this was a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I want us to believe for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Tikkun and on us because it's, it's one of our foundational values. So let's go over this. We believe in fivefold ministry. We believe in apostles and prophets being restored today. And that eventually all believers are going to be aligned with and accountable to apostolic streams that are going to come together in unity. The Lord showed me that 35 years ago. We believe in uh, the call to Jewish life. We believe in world evangelism. But one of our core foundations is we believe in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and all of his gifts. The Puritans believed that the world was going to see successive outpourings of the Holy Spirit. 
And most people think of Puritans as stodgy, straight-laced people who sat in pews, upright and stiff, and if they fell asleep, there was that guy that had the feather at the end of the long uh, stick and tickled them in their nose and woke them up for two-hour sermons. Now, the Puritans could listen to two-hour sermons, you know, but the Puritans were also people who came, many of them, to believe in the destiny of Israel. That was where the discovery of restoration of Israel and, uh, was, was rooted. It, it influenced the Lutheran pietists. And that came out of outpourings of the Holy Spirit, where sometimes the Puritans would have meetings, and the Spirit would come in power, and they would say, ten men fell down as dead, and they stayed in that state all night, and then when they awoke the next morning, they told us glorious things that they had seen about heavenly realities. There were parts of the Puritan movement that experienced the power of God. You can read about this in Ian Murray's great book, The Puritan Hope. Now, the reason why being filled with the Holy Spirit is connected to evangelism is that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when there is a revival and large numbers of people are tremendously filled with the Holy Spirit, they see as the Father sees, they feel as the Father sees, and they walk on a different plane of reality, nothing is the same. When you are highly filled with the Holy Spirit, your wife is more beautiful. When you are highly filled with the Holy Spirit, the flowers are more beautiful. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the pain of people is more painful. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the lostness of the lost is more alarming and more affecting in the depths of your being. It was in the being filled with the Holy Spirit that Shaul could say, I could wish myself to be a curse for the sake of my people. Do you think that was because he had an ethnocentric pride over his own people and wanted them to be saved above all else? No. It was because he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was in touch with the grief of God over the condition of our Jewish people. There are people that are writing books that are saying that everybody is ultimately going to be saved. So it's not a big deal. Try to get them into the kingdom of God, but, you know, they're going to get there eventually. One writer wrote a book called Love Wins. Well, I believe love wins, but it's not what he thinks love is. Because love can be spurned. He thinks love can't be spurned. Other people are, Jewish people are okay, because they're going to all be saved at the end. I think that the people that are writing these books not only are violating scripture, but I think that they're not very much filled with the Holy Spirit because they're not reading what God's heart is about people that aren't saved. They don't feel the grief, they don't feel the alarm, they're not experiencing hell. We need to pray for and believe for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the church and in the Messianic movement to recover what we read in the book of Acts. Because we read in the book of Acts you shall receive power, in verse 1 8, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. So, in the book of Acts, the greatest evangelistic move that our people have ever seen until recently, and we're going to see it again like this. We've seen little intimations of it. Now you might think it's a bit in, big intimation in terms of what Sid showed last night. You might think it's a big intimation in terms of what happened in the Jonathan, Jonathan Burness movement. But these are little intimations. Let me just say something about what Sid presented. I know that Sid used the right language when he said all these people made professions of faith. But the, the movie said they were saved. Yes. 
You know, we don't know that they were saved. They made a profession. And they are Russian Jewish people that don't have much in the categories of, you know, the resistance. This is why Jonathan Bernus was so powerfully effective. So these are Jewish people that are coming that don't have the usual barriers against the gospel. But there is a significant percentage of those people that are getting into discipleship. And who knows how it's going to affect their kids and their families if they do that. And I just want to say about Sid, the reason we have Sid here is not because we want you to get your theology from Sid. We want you to get Sid's evangelistic passion and the signs and wonders and the value of having this passion to see the lost come to faith. For example, we, 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 we probably in TQ don't believe that all cancer is demonic and if you cast out the demon, the cancer is healed. We probably don't believe that. But we think a lot of it's demonically rooted. And so, you know, we don't get our theology, we get the reality of the Holy Spirit and what God is doing through him to be imparted to us. Yes. And that's why we wanted him here. It's very important. He, he laid some of the foundations that are part of us in the beginning, years and years ago, late 70s and early 80s. But part of that foundation that has been so important to him was the power of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, we read that through the Holy Spirit, they all spoke in other languages as we are moving now close to the Feast of Shavuot, may it happen this year, and that they all heard the, heard the good news in their own languages. And there were miracles, the first great miracle of everybody speaking the gospel in languages that they had never heard of, so that all of the Jewish people from around the world who spoke different languages heard the gospel in those languages. Although that was a foreshadowing of the nations coming, it was mostly Jewish people there, 90%, 98%. Some proselytes, no doubt, some Gentiles. But signs and wonders continued from the guy healed at the gate beautiful to the stories of the book of Acts to people healed when handkerchiefs were sent out. And the effect of the Holy Spirit was also to gather people into community. So when you read the book of Acts, you long for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, like in the book of Acts, again and again and again. And so the first thing I want you to get is that we have got to be passionate about the same theology that the Puritans had, that as we move toward the, the coming of the Lord, we're going to see corporate outpourings of the Holy Spirit that are going to be larger and larger and more and more widespread until, as the Puritans said, the last revival that takes place before the return of the Lord will be a worldwide revival that will not pass away and will uh, affect a great harvest and will lead to the second coming of the Lord. Now, they're not saying we're going to take over the world with that. They're saying that will enable us to engage the biggest clash of the battle of good and evil that the world has ever seen. But the end of that battle will be the return of the Lord. And as part of that battle, there will be a great harvest. This is what the book of Revelation is talking about. Revelation chapter 11 talks about the city called Sodom. My city, Jerusalem, he calls it Sodom. But it says that after the earthquake and 7,000 people die, the city will turn to the Lord. That's going to be a time of revival, folks. You've got to see through the book of Revelation with all the judgments being poured out in the world as a time of revival for God's people and a time of great harvest. That's also in the book. So we're praying for a great outpouring of revival. But, you know... One of the things that we begin to question is how much revival can we experience unless we're in one of those corporate revivals? We make a little transition here. So number one, we're praying for a great, mighty, outpouring revival. But look, you understand 
that when the revival is happening corporately, all bets are off and wonderful things are going to happen. You get carried along with it. Jeff Bernstein made the statement that during the times of the Jesus movement, the believer would go up to an unbeliever and say, Hi, my name is Sam, and they would say, What must I do to be saved? I mean, it was like that. I don't understand it. The Jesus hippie mobile, the Volkswagen, winds up the mountain in New Mexico to visit the hippie farmers on the plateau in the mountains of New Mexico trying to grow food in the rocks. Because the hippies were kind of rock-headed that they would pick such places to build to grow food. They had lots of weeds. They get to the top of the mountain. I said to Akon Shishkoff, you could have bought acreage near Rochester. He said, well, that wasn't very romantic. <laughs> the mountains of New Mexico, that sounded romantic, not the plains of Rochester. <laughs> near Rochester, though. So anyway, winds up the mountain. Jesus, 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 a bunch of Jewish hippies farming in the mountains. Eitan Shishkov, Russ Resnick, Rube Rubenstein, all became Messianic rabbis. They're up there in the mountain, and they're thinking to themselves, what a bunch of idiots. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit falls on them. Eitan has a vision of Yeshua and his love, and Russ and everybody, and they're all, they're all saved, and they come down from the mountain and give their lives to the Lord. Natan's ministering to Jewish, to Hispanic people, and Native Americans, and Eliezer Urbach says to him, remember Eliezer, some of you? You should be giving your life for the salvation of your people. And he sent him to us. You know? How did that happen? They didn't give him apologetics, it was just something, it was just, it, it was just the atmosphere. And, and I believe we're going to see that happen again in the United States. And you know what? You can be a man who thinks you're a woman in a man's body using the woman's room when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and that'll be the end of that. to be personally revived yes. right. and, and I want to tell you that I'm thankful that I had a spiritual father in high school who taught me that because although we were not in revival he was in revival yes. Yes. he lived in his own personal revival space just like Pigpen brought the cloud of dirt around him he brought the cloud of the Holy Spirit around him Larry Carroll, who led Jack to the Lord. I'm going to be going and meeting with them in a couple of weeks, the congregation that Larry was in, because they've been going through some hard stuff, so I'm going to spend some time trying to help them work it through, where I was a charter member 50 years ago, came out of the Reformed Church where I started in 1960. So Larry would walk around praising the Lord. He was a walking personal revival, winning people to the Lord left and right, including our own Jack Jacobs, who's one of our Messianic rabbis, because they both had a business in the town. And whenever you talk to Larry, he had a praise for the Lord, joy for what he was doing, and just was leading people to the Lord all the time just because he was immersed in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. See, there's nothing more important to evangelism. In Mark chapter 16, 15, I told the story to the leaders. We read, These signs shall follow those that believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak new languages, they will handle snakes, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. 
and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. Now, this is in part connected to the command, go into all the world and make disciples of everyone. He that is immersed in water will be saved, and he that is not will not be saved. Now, I told you the story, how this really funny story, and if I had time I would tell it to you, but you know, I've got to get you to lunch so the hotel's not angry at us. But when I was called to go to Singapore in 1989, January, and Bob Weiner introduced me to Carlos Anacondia, and Carlos Anacondia, the famous evangelist from Argentina, grabbed my hands and prayed over me, and I fell under the power of the Spirit. And then I went and I was speaking to this huge, one of the most extraordinary missions gatherings up to that time in world history in Singapore. And I got to share with them the Israel message and the whole thing. It was amazing. It was through Ray Gannon who couldn't go that this happened. And, um, but then when Carlos Anacondia spoke, he used Mark chapter 15, chapter 16, verse 15 as his primary text, and that his whole ministry was based on believing that text. And I sat there having all sorts of problems because I knew that in some Bibles that text was in a footnote because it was not considered part of the original text. Because it's not in the earliest manuscripts. How many know that? I'm reading from the Tree of Life Bible. Mark and Daniel will tell you about our new Messianic Jewish version, which I've been a part of since the beginning. It was almost given birth at our conference years ago. And you know what? They didn't put it in the footnote. They did put a footnote there. But they didn't put the text in the footnote. And the more he was preaching from that text, in spite of my intellectual objections from seminary, the more I was feeling the power of God. More and more, my mind was going, no, no, my spirit was going, yes, yes. <laughs> now I prayed about this, and what I came to as a conviction was that these verses were an apostolic addition to the text. That, that it does have an apostolic credibility, and what's in that text is a summary of what the early believers believed in the first century, and it is, as well, all of the things in there are found in other texts. So it does summarize other texts that are in the New Covenant Scriptures in terms of what happened, and I think that an apostle uh, eventually appended this to the text, and that's why it goes back so early, and yet is not in all the early manuscripts. That's a theory. But there was such power when he preached that, that I walked in the presence and power of God for, for months after that, at a huge level, saw people falling under the power of God, left and right, when I ministered in a, a church, in a, a Anglican church in Singapore, experienced this out of this text. And I came to realize that the issue of our ability to win people to the Lord, or at least to confidently so see. Now I know that actually winning people to the Lord, it's up to the Holy Spirit in them. I've seen people face supernatural miracles right in front of them. The biggest miracles you can imagine and walk away from the Lord. So miracles don't necessarily bring people to the Lord, but they do open the possibility. But the but, but my point is, yes, you are not responsible to make it happen. That's right. up to the Holy Spirit right. in prayer when he's moving. But you're responsible to sow seed with power and to have God's heart for this. And it comes out of the Holy Spirit. And the issue is going to be, vis-a-vis -vis these signs follow them that believe, yes. is connected to Ephesians chapter 5. Where it says, 
Do not get drunk on wine, for that is recklessness. Instead, be being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. We can give ourselves to growing in greater and greater levels of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember Costa Deer, that great missionary statesman, spoke at Beth Messiah years ago. I think David and Elaine were there, Paul, you might have been there, others might have been there. And he got up and he sang this song, making melody to the king. And he sang it in Hebrew and English and he danced around with joy. And he actually was so full of the Holy Spirit that he left the whole congregation full of joy. Amen. This idea that we are going to give ourselves every day in the Holy Spirit, that we are going to be a personal incarnation of the Zinzendorf community at Hernhut, where they were constantly singing hymns to one another. I mean, they must have been really strange people. Instead of going up and saying, Hi David, how are you? Praise the Lord, hallelujah. No, I mean, he says praise the Lord back and we're singing to each other. What strange people. But that, that's what it was like in Hernhut a lot of the time. Now, they were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they spurred a missions movement and signed on to galley ships to die with the galley ship rowers so that they would be in heaven. And of course, heaven's only temporary because we know the ultimate goal is to return and rule in the age on earth. I always want to qualify that. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they went expecting to die, but to gain a harvest in dying. Yes. I believe that when we're that filled with the Holy Spirit, our reticence and embarrassment and fear over sharing will be gone. And we will yes. no longer say, you know, I want to share with somebody, but the Lord is not telling me. And he's not telling you because you're not filled enough with the Holy Spirit to be told. <laughs> If you're really filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be told. And I want to encourage you to believe today that you can have daily devotions, that you can go through the day singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and that you can go through the day doing something that is a wonderful thing, speaking in tongues. And we have an opportunity for being filled with the Holy Spirit anew this afternoon, that you can go through the day praying in tongues under your breath and constantly being filled. Yes. So you're praying in tongues and doing your accounting. Because he that prays in a tongue builds up himself. You're praying in tongues and you're developing your software engineering. That's right. Because you know when you're praying in tongues, you're, the, the rest of your mind can still function. It's quite amazing. You can learn the gift of praying in tongues like Rav Shaul more than you all because he that prays in a tongue builds up himself. How do you build up yourself? By growing into greater and greater capacity of Holy Spirit. Ruach HaKodesh. Yes. See, one of the things that's characteristic of Tikkun is that we are unabashedly a Holy Spirit movement. And that this is a foundation for us. So the whole thing I want to encourage you for today, knowing that the Word will be more vivid, your understanding will grow in your study of the Word, that everything will be enhanced if you will pursue being filled with the Holy Spirit every day and seeking to walk in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit every day. If we can attain a high level as a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and are maintaining that and go and become personal centers of revival in the midst of the world. Yes. Yes. 
even before the revival hits. Don't think you can't do anything until the big revival hits. We will see fruit. It's the biggest thing I can leave you with today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.